this. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Saturn V rocket provided one of the greatest achievements in human history, landing a man on the moon. But it owes its beginnings to a time of perhaps one of the worst moments in human history, the Second World War. Amongst the death and destruction of this conflict, a group of German scientists would create the first ballistic missile. This provided the ability to strike distant targets with a large explosive payload. In today's video, we explain the history of the V-2 rocket and its impact on World War II. If you enjoy this video and want to see more, hit the subscribe button. It's free and really helps the channel reach more history lovers like you. The V-2's journey would begin in 1930s Germany, when a young man named Werner von Braun attended the University of Berlin. Together with a small group of like-minded enthusiasts, they managed to launch two small rockets, one of which reached an altitude of 3.5 kilometres or 2.2 miles. Following a request from the German military, in 1936 he began working on a rocket with a 25,000 kilogram thrust engine, capable of carrying a one-ton payload. In the preceding years, the rocket's engine was tested over and over, with varying designs or various parts being tried. The Peenemunde Army Research Centre provided the perfect location for testing. Together with the V-1, this facility was able to give these scientists the secret facility needed. By October 1942, the first successful launch of a V-2 was complete, but a bombing raid by Allied forces in 1943, as well as a number of other delays, meant the rockets weren't quite ready to be used. Following the devastating destruction of some of the facility, it was decided that much of the manufacturing of the V-2 would be moved away from Peenemunde. A new underground facility was created in central Germany and hidden away from the risk of Allied bombers. Forced labourers from a nearby concentration camp were used to put the parts of the rockets together. The V-2 itself was 14 metres in length and 1.6 metres in width. It weighed in at 12,000 kilograms and was powered by a liquid propellant rocket engine. This included a mixture of 75% ethanol and 25% water, combined with liquid oxygen and pumped into a combustion chamber. One of the major drawbacks which heavily impacted the German population was the 30 tonnes of potatoes it took to create this ethanol to fuel a single launch. Once the liquid entered the chamber, it would cause extreme heat. While this combustion was taking place, the superheated exhaust gases flowed to the nozzle end of the chamber and into the bell-shaped exhaust, where the rapidly expanding gases would produce thrust. After a few seconds, the thrust would reach around 25 tonnes and the V2 would be lifted off the ground. There would then be enough fuel to push the rocket into the air for another minute. At 30 seconds, it would reach the speed of sound. At 60 seconds, it would reach its maximum speed of five times the speed of sound. After the fuel burnt out, the V2 would be in free flight, subject to atmospheric conditions. With the use of two gyroscopes, one for stabilisation and the other for guidance, the rudders could be moved to direct the rocket. At a velocity determined prior to launch, the guidance system would turn off and the V2 would be in freefall towards its target. On the 7th of September 1944, the first two rockets were launched at Paris. These two would crash shortly after takeoff, but a V2 launch the next day would hit its target. Two more on the same day were directed at London and hit their targets. The V-2s could either be launched at specific sites or from a steel launch pad which could be transported anywhere. The first was easy for Allied bombers to locate and destroy, but the second proved much more difficult. This was really the only way to defend against the V-2s, as they were travelling too fast in the air for fighters to intercept them. One of the only other methods was false information. British intelligence collected by the Germans indicated that the initial rockets hit areas west of London. 
This caused them to adjust the rockets to a shorter distance, so subsequent rockets in actual fact hit rural areas east of London. In all, some 6,100 V-2 rockets would be manufactured at Pienemunde and the underground facility in central Germany. Many of these would be used for testing or located unfired at the end of the war, but 3,100 would be directed at targets in Belgium, England, France and Germany. Antwerp and London suffering the most attacks, with 1,600 and 1,300 respectively. The damage caused by the rockets was a huge financial cost, but the loss of life was more significant. It's estimated that around 9,000 civilians and military personnel died as a result of the attacks. Worse still were the estimates of 12,000 forced labourers who died building the rockets themselves in horrible conditions. At the end of the day, the V-2 rockets weren't enough to turn the tide of the war for Germany. The cost to build each one was far too high in terms of labour and resources needed. But at the fall of the Third Reich, the Allies each rushed to gather as much information and research as possible. After the war, Werner von Braun would work for the United States and help with the space race. He would be an important figure to the development of the Saturn V rocket and would live long enough to see Neil Armstrong land on the moon, an amazing feat considering his early experiments with rockets in the 1930s. What are your thoughts on the V-2 rocket? Do you think it was an effective weapon for the Germans? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. As always guys, thanks for watching, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to expand your knowledge and join the growing Premier History community.